in our course, <coughs> you can find uh, lab instructions in uh, the folder lab files. And I just am working on these videos. We find uh, links to the three videos for the three experiments uh, than here. And this is a paper I want to uh, discuss with you in the next uh, video presentations. Here you can find some files uh, which are prepared and necessary for working through and reporting the three experiments. Okay, I open this paper and we uh, want to quickly go through these papers. Um, this paper uh, contains uh, information how you can reach Mr. Stewart, my lab, lab engineer. Uh, he is often available with this number or with his email address. Um, overview is about our three experiments. We have experiment number one, which <coughs> will train you in measurement and identification methods of step responses which is necessary to identify processes. Uh, experiment 2 is similar, uh, just working with Bode plots, measurement device for Bode plots and working theory in comparison with uh, real measurement of um, some uh, processes. <coughs> Finally, the real control system task is um, this with a speed control system including process identification and um, lab uh, controller design and comparison between different designs you have made. Okay, some information that you uh, should prepare this experiment, work through hopefully with success and then give a lab, uh, give a good lab report. And if all things are well done, then of course you get the credit points. Um, yeah. Let's start this video with uh, experiment one. Uh, this deals with unit step responses. My um, intention of this lab is uh, here you should test um, practical uh, measurement of step responses and the comparison with a theory. So uh, I want to show you that our theory is good and this fits to that what you measure. And of course, there are some differences, and all these differences uh, can be explained with some additional nonlinear effects or some additional information we have neglected, some approximations, uh, so that you can get a little bit more uh, uh, safety in working with step responses. The first step response you should measure. Uh, use this uh, device under test. This is an operational amplifier circuit with five components. Uh, you know this <coughs> circuit. We have learned th that this circuit is a PIDT1 um, circuit. The theory of this circuit is completely uh, can be found in the workbook on the PIDT1 pages. Uh, the values are given. You see here you have uh, two sets of parameters, two sets of uh, components. Um, the um, one component is the same, R1, C2 is the same. R1 is uh, always constant, C2 is always constant. But uh, R11 is very similar, R2 is the same. And C1 is then doubled. Here you see that is a, the big difference is that this C1 uh, compared between A and B is doubled. The other components are identical or very similar. Uh, you see here, there we have a, a source, one volt source with a switch. In early years, many years ago, we have really uh, voltage supply of 1 volt and a real switch, but uh, we have seen in the measurement with the scope that a mechanical switch has a problem of bouncing. Uh, so the uh, contact open and close is not done with one step because of um, mechanical effects 
uh, we get here pulses if we close this switch. So we uh, have to work now with an uh, unbounced uh, signal, which is produced with an uh, electronic circuit, which is presented uh, on one of the next page. Uh, note that you can find uh, for your report an Excel file. I have prepared an Excel file with many information so that you only have to fill your measurement values and the rest is then calculated with Excel at the comparison and the percentage error which you made between measurement and um, theory then automatically calculated. I want to have this table filled with your values then your report is easy done and I see uh, that your measurement is okay. Um, <clears throat> yeah, the uh, circuit for our step function generator is can be found here on the page. What is this for? Page page six. Um, I have to rotate this page that you can see the complete content of this page. Um, what you can see in this, this page, of course, is necessary to connect your devices with your circuit. You see here in the upper part, this is a step function generator uh, using uh, the two uh, <coughs> NAND gates, which are inverse feedbacked, which realized a set reset flip flop. If you uh, set this <coughs> to uh, positive 15 volt, uh, then automatically this will be a 1. If you uh, set this to plus 15 uh, to 0, then this is set to 1. So this uh, gives an uh, unbounced uh, output here uh, from 0 to 15 volt. This is then uh, level shifted to a voltage uh, to a 1 volt voltage value. Uh, and this signal uh, is switched to minus one volt from zero to minus one volt. So we can can say, okay, this step function generator makes a negative unit step response because this is an inverting amplifier. And this is our test uh, with the uh, test circuit with the uh, operation amplifier. This is an inverting amplifier. We want to have a positive output uh, response. So we need here a negative uh, step function. Uh, signal. Okay, here you see uh, letters which defines the plugs, and these plugs you can find uh, on the box uh, uh, on your lab table. And here are the components which should be connected to the uh, relevant uh, A's and B's and H and G's and so on. Yeah, this switch is important because with this switch you can unload a cap capacitor which is connected between uh, I, G or G, H or E, F. Uh, that is the integrator of my P, I, D, T, 1 circuit. Uh, and before you get a new output signal, you have to reset it to zero. Don't forget to reset it, otherwise you me measure nothing uh, in spite of a signal here. Here you stay at plus 15 volt until you switch this uh, you uh, take yeah uh, take the switch to unload the capacitor okay so this is information for the step function generator and uh, we go back to the circuits okay now i give you some information what you have to do uh, after measurement uh, at home in your report uh, for this I need uh, uh, I use my, my board here. Uh, the signal what you measure looks will look like this curve. That is the H of T signal of a PIDT1. Um, this signal goes up with a peak value round about 11 volt. So this could be a good check if your measurement signal goes not to 11 volts and there is something wrong. Then there is a valley and finally a ramp. And at home what you should do is you should draw tangents. Uh, one tangent is the uh, extrapolation of the ramp tangent down to this 
position and the second tangent is the uh, exponential pulse tangent in the starting point and the cross point of both connections is very important because this cross point gives information about k and t1 <coughs> and the peak value it gives information about the td and the uh, this time from there to there this is ti so with the both tangents and the peak value you can identify all four values which is necessary so this contains the information of td it's not td it contains information of td uh, c workbook page page workbook page 20 i open this workbook page <clears throat> here you see the uh, the unit step response of an pid and uh, the cross point of these tangents with k and t1 the distance between uh, the cross point of the zero starting signal with uh, together this cross point together with this cross point this is ti not to zero typical error in reading some reads ti from this cross point to the zero point here that is wrong now yeah, go to this point and you get the correct ti uh, <clears throat> to draw this tangent it could be better to get this point more exactly to make two uh, uh, two printouts two pr different printouts with two different scalings uh, two printouts uh, one scaling is in that way that you uh, see the negative gradient point on your paper this goes far back to the negative values so uh, the trigger point should lay in the middle of your screen then you get this curve this is the first one and the second printout should be optimized in that way that uh, or tx is sorry t cause time diagrams yes sampled signals uh, the next curve with a larger scaling here so that you just see the ramp function here but then you can better define the cross point of these both tangents yeah uh, that is a scaling number two uh, furthermore, you should uh, read in this signal into my identification program. Uh, in this identification program uh, with WinDF C sharp, uh, identification, ident module, uh, we have a connection between scope and uh, PC, and here you can read in the complete measured curve and then uh, identify with this identification mo module identify this uh, um, PIDT1 circuit two times and I open now the Excel table of uh, your documentation and I show you what you have to do uh, you get first from your both cases A and B four identified values td k t1 and ti uh, and at the same time you get from case a and b two identified windy fc sharp results in the printouts you can find the numbers so what you type into the excel table is the following so you get here <coughs> a table uh, for your reporting <coughs> you see here that is case 1a uh, 1a contains uh, eight parameters uh, PIDT1 can be defined with either these four parameters or with this is a parallel the summing form parameter and this uh, is a Bode form parameter both of course um, can be converted uh, converted from one to the other um, block this is done here with, with these equations. You see here there are equations behind this number. These are the theoretical values. Theoretical values calculated out of these R's and C's. 
uh, so check your equations if you have the same values the, the times are in milliseconds please note yeah, the times are in millisecond put in here your four measured values with WinDF four me measured values with uh, your tangent method and then automatically the pro program calculates the uh, percentage error of all eight values and if this error is t touching 20 percent then this could be an indication that you have made an error in your tangent method or an error in your identification method the error should be smaller than 20 percent very simple and mostly of course the error is smaller than 20 percent but 20 percent is, is for me the border limit for a check why you have so uh, bad values the same is with b case b 1b you get another four numbers for the WinDF uh, results and another four numbers for your tangent measurement results of course if i see your table and there are this this values without any change of view then of course you get the report back for correction okay this is the circuit number one case a and b here uh, the results should be uh, simply import into this table let's have now a look into the second part of this experiment just the operation amplifier circuit is the same but uh, here with different components if you check these components and compare with a dt2 you will find this is really a dt2 circuit which uh, can be found in a workbook on the dt2 page i give you the number that is number one uh, case one pidt one a and b and now uh, experiment one uh, part two uh, is the dt2 dt2 circuit uh, and in the workbook on page i give you here on page 18 in the workbook uh, you see this exactly the circuit with equations to calculate with given r's and c's uh, to calculate this dt2 case uh, dt2 system um, the border plot is only important for the second uh, experiment there you have a dt2 and measure a border plot but here you need the unit step response unit step response is calculated uh, this is the equation but the identification works with the first zero crossing value which is described here you need the first zero crossing time and with this you can calculate the omega e value and omega e mainly is dependent on omega naught that is one parameter on the damping this is the second parameter and for the damping of course you have the overshoot factor uh, or the decrement factor logarithmic decrement factor with which you then can uh, calculate the damping value d if you have the logarithmic decrement the ratio of the two maxima to maxima to minima so the, the situation this is workbook page 18 uh, you make a measurement which looks like the following signal uh, if your um, time uh, horizontal time division value is uh, not so good then you get this experiment so an exponential uh, decreasing of amplitude uh, of course this is <coughs> nice to see of course you can identify th th this also with WinDF C sharp uh, better note that the first zero crossing is that what contains information and here you have to to less resolution for this value uh, better go home with the following curve uh, with a much larger time scaling which has the maximum and then the first zero crossing and this t01 is uh, good for omega zero <coughs> but you need of course a uh, 
first minimum. You need this value. U main and then U max uh, used for the damping factor. So this is <coughs> that what uh, we can tell you from DT2. Again in the Excel table there is also a field uh, where you can type in your <coughs> identified values for the k value coming out of the maximum, uh, the omega naught value and the d value uh, coming out of the amplitude and the ratio of amplitudes. Yeah, the first maximum, I should show you the first maximum here, uh, um, it can be uh, the value where, where, uh, where you can uh, create, uh, extract the k value. Yeah, if with the first zero crossing and the um, logarithmic decrement with the d value, uh, then if d and omega naught is known, then with this equation you can calculate the k. Yeah, so in our writing we can say u max gives k. U min over U max gives T. This gives um, the omega naught value. So this is a way for an <coughs> extraction of system parameters out of a measured curve. And do the same with Windy FC sharp an identification method. Uh, with this module uh, in the lab, we of course can give you help to operate with this identification program. Uh, then in the third part, you see that the measurement is quickly done and identification also quickly done. The uh, presentation of the information here takes long, but the uh, working during experiment can be very fast. 1.3 has now a third circuit. This is also an operation amplifier circuit. <coughs> This is but only this is only an inverter. Uh, uh, after a three times RC a chain, uh, this three times R three chain uh, behaves like a three PT one block with loading of R four. R four is a load of this three PT one chain. Um, again, you should apply a unit step function here and measure the unit step response here with the scope put this data uh, into our pc with uh, an ethernet connection and then analyze this function uh, for this also some help uh, here we have given you the result with these values of the 3pd1 model we have analyzed this theoretically and the result uh, are these values so what we, uh, what we uh, give to you is one model containing three different time constants containing a 3PT1 model. If you want to see more information how we have done this, of course in the workbook uh, there is a page. I can show you in the workbook. Now this is the workbook. Uh, I check. Yes, this is an RC chain. Was hat er denn hier schon wieder gemacht? Ja, keine Ahnung. Ich das jetzt wieder wegkriege. <lacht> hat er mir was aufgemacht, was ich nicht wieder zukriege. Egal, stört ja auch nicht. Um, this is the three RC chain with op amp. Uh, I have analyzed this uh, transfer function. I have calculated this transfer function depending on uh, these eight uh, components with ideal operation amplifier. This is a result. And with these values out of the uh, lab experiment, we have measured the different capacitors. The, the nominal values of all the three capacitors are for microfarad, but we have measured these values with our uh, component uh, measurement device. So these are larger than nominal values. The resistances are also given. And here you can see the resulting uh, transfer function values with uh, my WinDF tool. There is a 3PT1 tool 
uh, we have calculated the three uh, time constants. With Windy FC Sharp, you can find all these uh, yeah, uh, algorithms and tools to calculate these three time constants. So these are known. You have it and have got it and uh, can compare now these theoretical values with your identification results. Okay, you should uh, know what curve we expect in 1.3. Uh, the resulting step response of a 3PT1 model is always a horizontal tangent, an increase section, and a uh, saturation section with the final value. The final value gives the value for k. And <clears throat> what you have to do during lab, if time is enough, or uh, in your reporting phase at home, uh, draw the inflection tangent. Draw inflection tangent. In Germany, Wende tangente. That is that point, the inflection point is that point where the uh, left curve goes into the right curve, or where, this, where you have the steepest point, yeah? the steepest point, steepest tangent. Steepest tangent is the inflection tangent. If you have this, do this carefully because this tangent defines for your times. Note that the scope throws out this point because you have to trigger uh, to the input signal. You have to use a two-channel scope. That there is on the table there is a two-channel scope. Trigger on the switching signal, then this zero is then fixed. And the scope knows where the input switching time is if you trigger on it. And this time scaling is automatically set to this trigger point. Uh, this uh, point gives your time TU from 0 to TU and from TU to this point we get the time constant TG. So this is uh, out of your tangent construction you get two resulting values and uh, this leads to the following model uh, and approximation without any algorithm, any computer, uh, gives the following value. The small value tu is then put into a delay time block, and the large value tg is put into a pt1 block. This is a delay, and this is a pt1, and that is the first approximation. So we identify our 3 pt1 process with a simplified model containing one PT1 and a delay. And in your report, you should compare the step response of this curve with the original step response of the three PT1 curve. Uh, the next identification should be done is, um, yeah, that is the first model. The second approximation comes with uh, Reuter method. Uh, you need the Reuter module, the uh, Reuter module in my identification program. Just want to have the input of TU, TG, uh, and then the program calculates the T1, T2, and sometimes delay time. So you get two PT1s with an algorithm described in the Reuter book. Uh, but this algorithm in the Reuter book is converted into a, a software algorithm, and you can have this software algorithm in WinDFC Sharp. I'll just quickly show you <coughs> how to uh, start this program and get to this Reuter module. Uh, English text get, yeah, the, if the program starts, it starts with English language. Different to Rexy Sharp. Yeah. And the FC Sharp starts with English uh, language. 
In identification module, you get here the second point is the Reuter method. And the Reuter method just uh, needs your TU TG value and calculates a T1, T2 value, and sometimes uh, a delay, a, de a delay, and uh, note these three values and throw these values into uh, the following resulting curve. That is the second approximation and the third approximation. Uh, you should calculate with WinDF identification, C sharp. There you should also identify a 2PT1 delay time model. 2PT1 and a delay. Try to uh, adapt this curve. The, the third approximation. And if you have these values out of WinDF C sharp, these values out of a Reuter module, these values out of your curve, then compare all these step responses with the following tool. In the lab, we have uh, prepared a signal block diagram. You can find this also in your Moodle course and WLN suffix, suffix uh, file CS1 lab task 134 models. And here you have to uh, calculate four step responses of all four models. What are the four models? This is a model given a theory. Uh, this is a model coming out of Windy C sharp. This is the model coming out of Reuter. And this is a model without any calculation, just fill here the TU and here the TG. And then print out four step responses and four Bode plot curves and compare them critically. That's your uh, job of 1.3. Um, finally, you should investigate a spring mass damping system, which is a me me mechanically uh, built up. Here is an axis, so the lever with a mass, a spring, and a damper. And we measure now the movement of this position of this position with this displacement uh, position sensor. And the position sensor gives its value to our scope. So what we do is we move this back, fix it, and then release the fix, and then you get an oscillation of this of this point. And the curve you will get looks like this curve that is a copy out of the PT2 workbook step response. Uh, we have discussed in lecture. And what you should do is uh, identify this mechanical system in that way that you extract out of this curve the um, damping factor and the natural frequency omega naught. K is not helping because here in our system K is 1. We only need these both values, uh, but we want to have the three physical uh, values, spring constant, mass value in kilogram, damping factor in newton per meter per second. Spring is uh, newton per meter. We want to have, uh, finally, the values of D and M. C has to be measured uh, on a very traditional way by uh, adding here a force or changing the force and measure the displacement of this uh, damper. Yeah, so that uh, that could be done easily uh, during lab with a ruler and uh, here in our system, uh, you measure the displacement with both mass blocks, then remove both mass blocks and measure the position again, then you have a clear force because the mass is, uh, the value of the mass is noted with the gravity, gravity factor, you can cover the, the Newton value, and the displacement change uh, relating to the um, uh, force change gives then the spring constant C. So C is measured tradi uh, on traditional way, and M and D coming out of uh, omega naught 
and the damping factor. Damping factor is the ratio of overshoot to undershoot or overshoot to final value. Um, you need the final value. That is a problem. We stop the measurement just after this zero crossing because we have, of course, friction of the damper. And then this uh, curve is then, uh, the smaller the amplitude is, uh, the more the friction uh, caused a nonlinear change. So we have to stop early enough. And the reconstruction of the final value can be done easily with this knowledge that the final value cuts equidistantal pieces, Tm, out of the oscillation. If your uh, approximated final value is too high, you see this is smaller than this. Is your approximated final value too, too low? Then this is longer than this. The correct final value position, the correct final value position is that height or this distance is equal to this distance. With a, a good triangle ruler, you can find out the values of Tm. We have equation of Tm and then you can uh, cal calculate the uh, ratio of this to this, this undershoot divided by this overshoot, or this overshoot divided by the final value. In both cases you get U, and U can be converted in a damping factor D. And if you have D and omega naught out of Tm, then you can calculate the other values. Okay, finally we want to have the mass value, the effective mass value, that is not the both blocks, because all other parts here also have masses and are moving. Uh, and the damper value in Newton per meter per second. Now, these values should be extracted uh, out of your measurement and in your Excel table. Finally, uh, you can find here in point four, uh, again, numbers where you can put your C value measured manually and your both uh, identified values from WinDF and your both identified values from your manual uh, identification uh, using uh, final value extraction and yeah, uh, overshoot undershoot ratios and so on. And then the program automatically calculates from these using the equations in the paper, the damping factor and the mass. Okay, yeah, in red, please change only values in green areas, all others are calculated behind the equations in Excel. Yeah? Okay, so far this is experiment one. You see nearly 40 minutes explanation. All the other experiment preparation videos are shorter.